Hello, Minions. Welcome to Professor Awesome and the Minions of Doom. Uh, so I want to talk to you today about two subjects. Uh, the first one, which is, I, I guess, the main topic of this, uh, is the subject of how to enjoy medieval literature. Now, in some other casts, I've talked about specific works of medieval literature, and, you know, this is, I'll, I'll do that many, many times. Uh, but I do get a lot of questions uh, from people who basically say things like, I feel like I want to read medieval literature, but I want to enjoy it, um, and I find it very challenging. I felt like it was better when I was in high school and was forced to read it, and now I don't care for it, and I want to care for it again. Uh, and this is often, uh, uh, so to say, with people uh, looking at the bookshelf behind me and saying, uh, did you really read all those books? And the answer, of course, is, uh, yes, I read all those books. And uh, this is actually in my office, is the smallest bookshelf I have uh, in my office uh, by a lot. The, the rest are quite, are quite big, and, you know, that's how you, you get to be there. But part of it is not just reading. I mean, some things that I have to read are, are work. They're just a lot of work to read, uh, and I don't really enjoy them. But a lot I do enjoy, and I want to talk to you a little bit about how to get that kind of enjoyment out of them. So the first thing is this issue of it's hard to read, generally, like putting the words together uh, it's hard to read. Now, now this can be for a couple of reasons. Uh, one reason can just be a poor translation. Very often, maybe your local library or what you can get free off the internet is a kind of older translation, which maybe isn't very good, or is going for something that aims at uh, suggesting the original sound of the language. Uh, and so because of that, sometimes they're not very readable. In other cases, the problem is not that they're not very readable, uh, because of the translation, but rather maybe it uses a poetic style in the original source uh, language that is the kind that we don't really use that much anymore, and so it's hard to read or strange. Uh, and so what I would recommend uh, that you do in that case is simply read aloud. Now, it's a lot of work to read something aloud, uh, you know, the, the entire work aloud, um, and you shouldn't have to do that. If you just sit down and every time you go to read it, you maybe just read aloud to yourself for two or three minutes. You'll begin to hear the cadence and get the sense of the words. It'll force you to slow down enough uh, to pick everything up. And it and after just a couple of minutes, you'll realize that you don't need to read aloud anymore. Uh, this, by the way, also gets an uh, additional way that you can handle this, which is simply listen to it as a book on tape. Uh, there's no particular reason that you have to look at the words on a page. You can hear someone else read it to you. And in some cases, you know, I've, I've had a few people who said uh, about various books, but often about these sorts of medieval books, that they first listened to it on tape, and then they went and they, they read it afterward. But it was still an additional pleasure experience to do that. Uh, there's no reason that this has to be a painful experience. You know, you, you should be able to enjoy it and be able to enjoy the language. I assigned for next week for my students to read Paradise Lost, uh, which I know is not medieval, but you get the, the sense of it. And very often they find the language very, very frustrating. And so I advise them in the same way to read aloud. Those who do generally are surprised by how beautiful they find it, how moving they find it. Those who don't often find it to be this terrible slog through this text. And it takes them longer than they thought, and they hate it. Uh, so just spending two or three minutes every time you sit down reading it aloud will help if the language is a little bit uh, opaque. Another thing I think that you really want to do is ignore footnotes. Uh, now, obviously, sometimes you'll see a, you'll see something you're not going to have any idea what it's about, 
and you're going to be curious, and there might be a footnote there that you can, you know, you can feel free to look at them. But in my experience, largely footnotes uh, tend to not really be illuminating for your first time read through or your or your read through for pleasure. Uh, instead, they get into the weeds. A good example of this is uh, Dante's Inferno. You know, uh, this is the Norton Critical Edition. Dante's Inferno is a very thin book. I mean, this one looks moderate sized until you realize, uh, you know, uh, really a very short amount, like that much of the book is the poem, and the rest of it is uh, other things to make it worth, other things to make it worth uh, putting in there, uh, make it worth the, the cost of printing it. And, uh, you know, the problem, Dante's Inferno is, I think, a really good example for this, because you can often get deep in the weeds of the politics of uh, what was going on uh, in Italy in his time to explain why this was going on or why he said this. And if you're curious about it, yes, sure, look at the footnotes, find it out. But truthfully, uh, not just then, but almost through all time since, people have not read uh, the Inferno because they were particularly interested in the ins and outs of, of uh, Italian politics of that time. Instead, people have read it for the ironic punishments uh, that aren't just ironic, but really get at the heart of what that sin is about and uh, how people, both people that you like and people that you don't like, can be drawn into this sort of sin. And you can sort of see the way that what happens in the Inferno reflects really what happens in our world and presumably then see it uh, in your own life. So getting lost in the in the footnotes about the vagaries of of what was happening at this time or that time, it's not really going to help with your enjoyment of it. And in fact, uh, I would say you would only want to read those sorts of things maybe your second or third time through. If you really if you really love it, then going back through and rereading those things to get a sense of the tale that you missed in the first time. Uh, if you don't like it enough to reread it then you're fine going through life not knowing those details and just having enjoyed the text. And so the third thing I would say is don't be afraid of placing yourself in the past or bringing the past into the present. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean, very often there's this kind of snide uh, dismissal of reading of fantasy literature as being escapist. Whereas the medieval literature somehow, which is uh, on which that fantasy literature is based, is somehow not escapist. Well, at the time that the medieval literature was written, it may or may not have been escapist. I would argue it often largely was, particularly uh, medieval romance, uh, epic, etc. Uh, but uh, regardless of whether it was uh, or not, for us today, this is not our world. We're really escaping into the world. And that can be for good or for ill. You know, um, uh, Mark Twain's A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court uh, is, uh, for many people, you know, various adaptations of this are their main understanding of Arthurian legend. Uh, but interestingly enough, mostly they only adapt the first half of the book, because the first half of the book, uh, the Connecticut Yankee goes to Arthur's court and he does the kind of thing that you would expect to see, you know, in a king in King Arthur's court or, uh, or, uh, uh, on, uh, on a, or a spaceman in King Arthur's court where they bring their knowledge of the future into the past and they're able to wow everyone. Uh, and uh, basically defeat all their enemies because of their knowledge of some future thing or they're bringing back some future technology. And that's very much what happens in the first half of the book. What happens in the second half of the book is much darker, where, in essence, the changes that, uh, that the Connecticut Yankee has wrought uh, bring about horrible, horrible war in which you literally at one point is you have to climb over a mountain of bodies uh, of those that have been killed by him and the people who uh, and the people who followed him and the people who opposed him. So 
Uh, Connecticut Yankee, we like the side of it that uh, flatters us, and we don't like the side that says, hey, maybe we're not that great. But but my view, uh, at least from my experience of reading medieval literature, is that, you know, if you read one or two texts, you think, yeah, that's awesome, that's like me, or that's like my situation today, or you, you, you create for yourself a kind of uh, heroic version of yourself. But the more you read and the more you get into it, the more humbling it becomes when you realize that you're not a better person than they were, uh, that you're not necessarily any happier than they were, you're certainly not necessarily a more moral person than they were, uh, you're not more intelligent than they are. Uh, there's a wonderful... Uh, uh, there's a, a wonderful... Uh, uh, moment in Connecticut Yankee and Canthers Court where you realize that the Yankee has to have an unbelievable amount of, of personal knowledge. Uh, you know, frankly, for most people today, if they were to go back into the past, their ability to wow people with their, uh, with their mastery of modern technology would be, let's say, very limited. You'll show off your iPhone, which will work for about a day maybe, until the battery runs out, and then you're going to do what exactly? Yeah, nothing. That's what you're going to do. <laughs> you you literally have no skills that are useful uh, to, to that world. I suppose maybe if an Amish person went back and who's developed a lot of skills they, that would translate easily and then could use those in some other way, maybe that would be helpful, though, of course, they would be uh, ideologically opposed to making a lot of big changes. So, um, all these things, we're always playing in someone else's playground. We're always in someone else's world. So don't be afraid of that part of it. Go ahead and embrace it. Uh, let yourself enjoy the thought of that world that was and is not anymore. Uh, and then, you know, uh, over time, you'll begin to see your own world in, in a new way, in a different way. Um, I would also say, I think I've talked about this before, but I'll I'll mention it again. Uh, if you're like, yeah, great, I want to read something for pleasure, what should I read? Um, almost always my first uh, my first recommendation for people for the for medieval uh, for European medieval work is Giovanni Boccaccio's The Decameron. And the Decameron's really thick and scary looking, but it's called the Decameron because it's a book of uh, it's ten young people go out for ten days to escape the plague, and they decide to pass the time by each of them telling one story a day. So there's a hundred short stories in here. Uh, so you know some short stories. Well, here's a good example. Just open to a random page. Story begins here, uh, ends here. So this one's less than two pages long. Uh, you know a twenty page story is going to be a really really long uh, story in the Decameron. There are many good translations. Now, you can go get some free translations uh, various places online. I would actually recommend that you go to the library or buy a used copy because a really good translation uh, and a, a contemporary translation is just going to make this a lot more fun for you. And it is very fun. Uh, a lot of the stories are funny and uproariously so. so uh, some of them are dirty, some of them are pious, some of them are deeply moving, but they do depict a, a world which in some ways is alien to us, but in other ways is really, really familiar to us. So those would be the three things that I would recommend that you do when you're approaching you know, reading medieval literature for, literature, literature, for, literature for pleasure. Begin by reading out loud, um, then ignore the footnotes and the introduction apparatus, just get right into the literature. And then finally, feel free to just sort of imagine yourself into that world. Uh, it won't hurt, and over the long run, it will, in fact, I think, help. Now, the second thing uh, that is the non-academic side of this. So, um, my students have uh, essentially been telling me lately uh, that I am a mysterious figure, even though I very public figure, and that I tell a lot of stories that cannot possibly be true, uh, they think, and then when they discover that they, those stories are true, they start to wonder, they, I think they fill in the blanks and think that there are a lot of interesting and strange things. Uh, and so I've 
told them I would begin to uh, introduce a little bit more biographical information uh, into uh, these netcasts. And so uh, one in particular I just wanted to enter today, which someone had asked about, is my nemesis. I do have a nemesis, and that nemesis is someone I call the Black Glove. I'm going to call the Black Glove he, but I, in fact, don't know who the Black Glove is. And the Black Glove has plagued me for years. So my first encounter with the Black Glove was, I don't know, I'm going to say at least seven years ago, if not longer, uh, maybe ten years ago. And an uh, important part of this is to know that I have a carpet shampooer in my home. And so uh, the background of this is I had uh, uh, vacuumed the house uh, and then had shampooed the carpet. And I had done so in my bedroom. This is an important element. So I had vacuumed and then shampooed the carpet in the bedroom, you know, where I sleep every night. Two days after this, I went into the, my bedroom and I was uh, putting some things away and I looked down and realized that laying there on the floor was a single woman's, I think, black glove. Now, to my knowledge, there had been no one in my bedroom. And I know because I had both uh, vacuumed there and shampooed there, there's no way it was sitting there. So sometime in the, in the two days prior, someone had come into my house and had placed a black glove. Now, first of all, it wasn't winter. And second, this is Alabama. No one needs gloves, uh, even in the even in January. Uh, so there was no particular reason that there should have even been a black glove. And it looked a little bit like a formal glove, I guess, uh, that was just laying there. And I didn't know what to make of it. And it was mysterious. And over the years, ever since then, I have found uh, black gloves placed in, uh, you know, some of the times in my office uh, where someone would have had to break into my office to, to get in there. Uh, sometimes in my home in various places. Sometimes... Uh, you know, uh, in other places like my car, or, uh, just essentially a calling card to show that the black glove uh, had been there. Uh, and it's a great mystery as to who the black glove is. And if you're thinking like, what, so is he imagining this? Are there a bunch of different, uh, is he making the story up? Here is just a collection of black gloves that I have found in my office. These are just the gloves that I found in my office over the last few years. And there's all sorts of gloves. Uh, there's probably one, two, three, four, this is the scariest one, five, six, seven. There are seven gloves here I found through the years uh, just in my office, laid on my keyboard uh, or um, in some other place. So yes, my nemesis, the black glove, is real. Um, I don't know what the Black Glove wants, what the Black Glove intends, uh, but the Black Glove is one of the stories that I tell to my classes, which they think that can't possibly be true, but it is true. So if you're out there, Black Glove, I'm on to you, and someday I will get you. So, Minions of Doom, uh, I've been trying lately to end with marching orders for you, uh, and my marching orders this time are seek out the Black Glove and bring the Black Glove to me so that he or she may face justice.